Ian Weekly is starting right now. And that to me was one of the scariest things that I uncovered in the book was this, as you sort of hint at, the idea that actually there is a very active constitutional debate over whether the Speaker in the, of the House or the President pro tem of the Senate can actually ascend to the president. I read this book called Raven Rock, and I heard about this, the book, actually a little while ago on another podcast. And then when Brock Long said he was reading it and he recommends reading the book, I went and got it. I read it. I highly recommend reading the book. Those of us that are in emergency management, this really goes back to the beginnings of our time as EM. It goes into a lot of what FEMA was and is, and there's some really cool uh, stories in here. And as a guy who loves history and a guy who's been in emergency management for a long time and one who teaches it, I learned a lot uh, uh, from, from this book. And I have Garrett here with me talk about his book. So Garrett, welcome to EM Weekly. Well, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. So what made you write? Raven Rock. So uh, Raven Rock is the history, as you said, of the U.S. government's doomsday plan, sort of all of the weird things that would have happened during and after a nuclear attack uh, in the U.S. government during the Cold War, and even in, in many ways up to the present day. I mean, these are still in many ways the plans for what would happen if we found ourselves in a nuclear exchange with North Korea or, or with Russia. And as you and many of your listeners know, the programs are generally known under the umbrella of continuity of government and continuity of operations, COG and COOP. And I have covered national security in Washington for you know more than a, a decade at this point and had bumped up against these plans time and again during the time that I was covering people, you know, talking to people who had been evacuated to mountain bunkers outside Washington on 9-11, uh, people who were part of the COG plans during the Obama administration. I flew at one point for a story with the first helicopter squadron of the U.S. Air Force, which is based at uh, Joint Base Andrews and is one of the military units that sort of oversees you know, the evacuation protocols for the U.S. government. Uh, but what really got me interested ultimately in turning this into a book was in 2010 or 2011, I was at my, uh, I was at Washingtonian Magazine where I was working then. And one of my colleagues brought in a U.S. intelligence officer's badge that he had found on the floor of one of the subway parking garages, the Metro in D.C., and he, and my colleague said, you know, hey, like this guy lost his badge. You cover this stuff. I'll bet you can figure out how to get it back to him. And so I start looking at it and then turn, turn it over and see that there are on the backside evacuation instructions. And they, they get on Google Maps and start following it out from D.C. into Virginia and out into West Virginia, ultimately. And I can see on Google Satellite that the directions end up on this mountainside in West Virginia, where this road runs up the mountain, and then there is a chain link fence and a guard shack, and about you know, 50 or 100 yards further up the road, the road just disappears into the side of the mountain behind these big concrete blast bunker doors. <laughs> now, this was a facility that didn't exist on any map. I, I had never heard of it. And I was like, wow, like this is one of the cog bunkers that the government has built since 9-11. Like this is some of the new stuff that sort of has come into existence since September 11th. And that got me interested in sort of figuring out as much as I can about the modern plans and then tracing the history back, uh, you know, right to the start of the Cold War. And, and as sort of you, you alluded to in your introduction, what, what emerged to me was this sort of much richer story and much more interesting story than I had originally imagined about how really planning for these disasters, planning for nuclear war, 
really fundamentally altered the U.S. government, the, the presidency, and, and in many ways sort of created the modern world in which we live as Americans. It really did. You know, I, it was amazing to see, like, that transformation. I, I love the story in the book when you talk about uh, Truman's White House, where the piano comes crashing through the floor, and they use that as the opportunity to shell it and then make it into the bunker that we think of as today with the situation rooms and, and all that kind of stuff. And everything was done, though, under this secrecy, like they've shell corporations, not corporations, but shell um, ideas of, shell oh, okay, yeah, yeah, shell, we're, yeah. we're going to be making this over here, but this is what it really is, you know, and it's funny because they did it realistically in front of everybody and just people even either didn't care or didn't pay attention or they went, oh, okay, it's odd, but whatever. You know, you talk about it in the book as well with the people around Raven Rock, I think it was, where they knew something was weird going on, but they just didn't really, you know, investigate it. Is that, was that because yeah. we were more naive in the 50s or is it because we just did a better job of hiding our secrets in the plain sight? It's a really good question. And I think that, so there are a couple of different answers to it. I mean, so you use the example there of Raven Rock, the, the name of the book, which for the listeners who don't know, is, the, is, is really the backup Pentagon. It's a facility in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, that was built in the 1950s and really is the, you know, it is a hollowed out mountain with a small freestanding city built inside. I mean, sort of the scale of these facilities are, is really sort of unfathomable to most people. The idea that there's a city inside of a mountain in Pennsylvania that can hold 3,000 people in the event of a surprise attack on the country is really incredible. But, you know, there were sort of a couple of factors going on at the time uh, that made it easier to keep these secrets. One was you know, we were locked in what we, uh, uh, American society really felt was an existential struggle against communism. I mean, the, the sort mm -hmm. of this titanic battle that we were in uh, with the Soviet Union uh, was something that affected almost every aspect of American life. And so we, uh, you know, people really took that secrecy very seriously, even if they happened to know it accidentally. Uh, it, but but then sort of the other thing, which I think is sort of so interesting in thinking about the way that communications revolutions have changed and, and evolved, is that in many ways the secrets of the continuity of government program during the Cold War are a reflection of how hard it was for information to travel back then. Mm -hmm. That you could have, you know, these small communities uh, around Washington and Pennsylvania and Maryland. Virginia, West Virginia, where people sort of more or less knew as an open secret that there were these government bunkers hiding away, that there were uh, these, these mountain facilities. But that information was really hard to get out of those communities. I mean, there was sort of no internet, there was no Wikipedia, you know, there weren't, weren't blogs. And so <laughs> as long as the, you know, sort of the quote unquote mainstream media wasn't reporting on them, they stayed secret. And, and it's this sort of fascinating example of how even these things that were relatively common knowledge inside small communities just never went beyond those small communities because the information was so hard to, to spread back then. Right. There's no conspiracy blogs out there back then, right? Exactly. You know, it's funny. I remember watching uh, one of the movies, Mel Gibson movie, I think it was, where he was a conspiracy theorist and he would have his little newspaper that he wrote and it was all hand typed and, and photocopied. And <laughs> I suppose those were sort of the early things and maybe that stuff was floating around there, but no one ever paid attention to those people because, you know, it wasn't on the internet, right? Right. So, um, so, so you go into this thing, you start talking realistically about the, the history all the way up, you know, until the Cuban Missile Crisis. The plan never was really put to test. And a couple of practice tests here, stuff like that, but not not an actual. So am I wrong? Kennedy, was he the first one to really kind of implement the COG plan? Yeah. So th there's sort of a couple of different eras of these plans uh, as they unfold through the Cold War. It, you know, one of the things that's really hard to recreate and, and reimagine 
at this point is that really for the first decade of the Cold War, there was the expectation in the United States that nuclear war could happen, but not be that terrible, <laughs> that you were dealing with, you know, slow nuclear bombers. So you would have eight to 10 to 12 hours worth of warning. You were dealing with atomic bombs, not thermonuclear hydrogen bombs. And you weren't dealing with all that many bombs. You know, we were, you know, the Soviet Union, you know, was, had, you know, 60 to 80 atomic bombs. And so there was sort of the idea that, you know, the entire country should be prepared for nuclear war, but that nuclear war could be survivable. And so you had, in a way that really is baffling to understand today, nuclear war be very much a part of uh, daily American life, that the U.S. government ran these big national drills called Operation Alert through most of the 1950s, where for the better part of a week, you know, the government and institutions would practice nuclear war, you know, the People would rush to fallout shelters. Uh, you know, the stock market would close. The buses in New York City would pull over and drop people off and hustle them into fallout shelters. That Dwight Eisenhower and his cabinet would disappear into these mountain bunkers on uh, mountain facilities at Mount Weather, which is sort of the main presidential executive branch bunker uh, in Berryville, Virginia, about 80 minutes west of Washington and, and would run, you know, sort of this practice nuclear war drill for like three or four days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the press would be there reporting on it and sort of the whole country would be drilling on it. I mean, it's sort of crazy to think of the idea of, you know, the U.S. president now disappearing for three or four days to practice nuclear war. I mean, like the, it, it was just sort of so far removed from what our you know, sort of current thinking is. Right. But then as these nuclear war sort of worsens and you have the switch from bombers to missiles, you have the, the switch from atomic weapons to thermonuclear weapons, and you have the weapons, sort of the number of weapons rise from a few score and a few hundred to thousands and ultimately tens of thousands of warheads. Nuclear war becomes something that you just can't ready for, that there is really no realistic expectation that nuclear war would be survivable for ordinary Americans or that you could sort of prep for it in the way that we had in the 1950s. And so the U.S. government's ambitions gradually shrink over the course of the Cold War from these grand public national drills into this private set of exercises, this secret set of exercises by the 1970s and 1980s, and even sort of up to present day, really, that, in, that involve entirely a narrow focus on ensuring that a small number of high-level government officials are able to be whisked off to these bunkers while the rest of us are left to fend for ourselves. You know, it's kind of interesting in that aspect of it that where I forget the guy's name and if you could fill me in on it. One of the one of the guys you wrote about in the book was basically saying if a nuclear war occurred and the United States had two survivors and the Soviet Union only had one, we won. And that was sort of that that uh, mentality of, of that time of total annihilation is the whole mad concept of just destroy it all, but if two people live, we win the war. And it seemed absolutely Yeah. And that seemed to shift a little bit, depending on who was in the administration when it comes into it. And then when we, once we get to the idea that both sides go, well, yeah, only insane people would ever start a war. Um, the Soviet Union felt the same way. It seemed like we felt the same way, according to the book. Then we get into the 70s with uh, Carter, and he sort of changes things. And it's funny because I actually got a little uh, ribbon from some of the guys here at work because I started talking about that Carter was more of a hawk than I thought he was, you know, they're like, yeah. ah, you know, that, that, that kind of blew my mind that he actually kind of went back to the concept of, can we do survivability or can we do annihilation? Tell me a little bit about that transformation between total annihilation of we're going to blow everything up to maybe we could survive it back to where we are again, where, where maybe we can't survive everything. Yeah. And, 
Uh, as you said, sort of part of what is so interesting about this is sort of these cycles that the U.S. government runs through, these different ideas uh, and different approaches for how you know, nuclear war might unfold. And, and you're exactly right. I mean, sort of one of the most surprising aspects of this, looking back now, is to realize that very few presidents did as much to push forward our nuclear capability or our nuclear readiness as Jimmy Carter, who we sort of think today as, you know, sort of this humanitarian hero in his post-presidency, but sort of a, you know, relatively hapless president himself. But we've sort of forgotten that actually Jimmy Carter was a nuclear officer himself, Mm -hmm. really the only president we've ever had with firsthand experience with the nuclear arsenals. Uh, You know, he worked on nuclear submarines during his time in the Navy and brought that approach to the presidency. And really much of what we think of as uh, sort of the Reagan era hawkishness, the policies and the weapons systems and the defense buildup of the 1980s were really begun under Jimmy Carter and that he was, as you said, sort of much more of a hawk than most people realize. And that uh, that he really pushed, uh, unlike almost any other president, to make the continuity of government system something that was sustainable and implemented sort of programs like the designated survivor um, to ensure that there is sort of always someone ready to be president of the United States. And that's sort of one of these like huge transformations that takes place over the course of the Cold War that's a loss to most Americans, which is, you know, we think of the president as the person that we elect on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. But the truth of the matter is that in the, uh, in the Cold War and the post-Cold War era, you have this shift to the idea of what's now known as the office of the presidency, that it actually encompasses several hundred people and not, you know, you have the the president, the vice president, the speaker of the house, the president pro tem of the Senate, and then all of the cabinet officials, but then each a huge line of succession, you know, that can be 15, 20, 25 people long to ensure that there's sort of always someone ready to step into those cabinet jobs. And that this was was really sort of something that came about through the Cold War as time and space condensed to the point where we needed to have sort of instant access to the president, to the vice president, and to anyone else who might be stepping into that nuclear authority that we we know as the, the national command authority. That, you know, sort of as late as FDR's presidency, when he went off to dedication of the Hoover Dam, his motorcade got lost in the canyons around Las Vegas, and he (laughs) disappeared for the afternoon. I mean, no one knew where he was, what had happened to him, where he might appear, how long he might be out of touch. And, And as late as 1945, when Harry Truman himself took over as vice president, the vice president didn't receive any Secret Service protection. You know, he could sort of wander around Washington on his own with the expectation being that sort of as long as you could get in touch with the vice president, you know, within a couple of hours or by the next day, that was sort of as quickly as the U.S. presidency needed to move back then. Now we have this whole apparatus that we that we sort of you know, the, the imperial toys of the presidency, Air Force One, Marine One, the armored motorcades are, are really tools to ensure that the president of the United States can launch nuclear weapons wherever he is, that he is in constant communication with the national command authorities, with the Pentagon's National Military Command Center, with Raven Rock. And that these, uh, that this the arrival and even sort of the invention and the creation of the 25th Amendment, the constitutional amendment in the uh, proposed in the 1950s and 1960s to bring about order to the ideas of presidential succession was an invention of the Cold War to ensure that we always knew who was president of the United States. Because 
uh, frankly, when you go back through history, in the first 150 years of the United States, there were you know, more than 40 years where there wasn't really anyone in line to take over the presidency because of the death of a, a vice president or a resignation of a vice president, and that it was really uh, sort of totally acceptable you know, for the first 150 years of America, that that job stand vacant uh, in between elections. But then the nuclear command authority required us to sort of suddenly have all of these procedures and communication systems to allow and ensure the succession of the U.S. president. So that was a really interesting part about the book, too, that when you started talking about, I think it was Zachary Taylor, when he was the vice president and became he sort of took over the role, and constitutionally, that might have not even been the right thing for him to do. And that the, that the vice president wasn't always going to necessarily be the the next guy coming up. And, and I really found that I was like, wow. And, and like I said, I'm I'm pretty astute in history, and I didn't even realize that was was the case. And so realistically, the concept of president, vice president, and then the speaker of the house is really a modern concept, and it's still even to today according to your book, isn't really hammered out all the way through. The answer to that question and more when we return from our break. The modern emergency manager wears a lot of hats. So how do you also fit in the needs of your exercise program? It is a matter of time. And how much is your time worth? A lot. TTX Vault is the answer to getting some of that time back. We offer pre-assembled tabletops, drills, and functional exercises spanning NIMS, hospitals and healthcare, special operations, and more, all coming from the archives of the Blue Cell. Get a jumpstart on the exercise process and visit us today at www.ttxvault.com. Emergencies happen, whether they're related to medical emergencies, threats of physical violence, weather related or other. One of the most difficult things during an emergency is to find help and quickly and efficiently communicate with all parties, regardless of whether you're an administrator, law enforcement, or the end user. With Titan HST, we help distort time by creating high-tech yet simple-to-use mobile-based applications that connect you with the people who can help you. At Titan HST, we believe in the power of people. Hi, this is Todd DeVoe from EM Weekly. If your company is in the emergency management and response space, EM Weekly is a place for you to advertise. Each week, we bring in experts in emergency management, response, and leadership from around the world, and they're here to share their best practices. Our listeners are eager to learn about new products and ideas, so this is the space for you. For more information, please contact Brian at brian at emweekly.com. And so realistically, the concept of president, vice president, and then the Speaker of the House is really a modern concept, and it's still even to today, according to your book, isn't really hammered out all the way through. And that, to me, was one of the scariest things that I uncovered in the book was this, as you sort of hint at, the idea that actually there is a very active constitutional debate over whether the Speaker in the, of the House or the President pro tem of the Senate can actually ascend to the president. It, it's never been tested before, no less in authority on the Constitution than James Madison, the man who wrote the Constitution, says that the Speaker of the House and the President pro tem of the Senate cannot step into the leadership of the executive branch from the legislative branch, and that actually the rightful next person after the vice president should be the Secretary of State. But that's actually a very active area of debate right now. And so you can sort of imagine chaos that would unfold if we end up in a catastrophic scenario where Paul Ryan is trying to ascend to the presidency and Rex Tillerson steps out there and says, nope, I'm the next legal authority in the United States. And unfortunately, you know, we, you, you imagine that that would not necessarily that, that's a drama that would play out in the courts for sure, but not necessarily at the speed you would need for the decisions in a crisis. And that in sort of a very weird way, you would end up with, with the watch officer at the Pentagon or Raven Rock 
uh, who just happens to be on duty that day, uh, basically making a personal decision about whether it's the Speaker of the House or the Secretary of State of the United States that they want to listen to uh, as they're considering nuclear launch orders. <laughs> so, okay, so we go back to when Reagan was shot. And there's a couple of really kind of interesting parts about this that, that I picked up. Now, one, I do remember when I believe it was the Secretary of State at the time who stood up and said, I am in control, which really threw people into a tizzy thinking that there was a... Uh, yep, the Al, Al Haig. Yep. Al Haig, right. He said, I'm in control. And so people, yeah, that kind of threw people into a tizzy. And then the second part about it was that the Ronald Reagan lost his, his codes and the FBI took yep. them. So talk about that just a little bit. So... And unfortunately, it's sort of newly relevant the last couple of months with North Korea as we are sort of relearning all of this history about nuclear launch protocols. Um, but the, the nuclear football, which is the black briefcase that follows the president around, carried by a rotating set of military aides, is never supposed to be very far from the president. It, you know, if the president gets on an elevator, the nuclear football gets on the elevator with him. When you see the pictures of him on the golf course, you know, the, the golf cart motorcade is such that the third golf cart uh, behind the president is the one with the military aid carrying the nuclear football. And that football, though, is sort of a lot more boring than most people think. You know, we have this idea from pop culture that it's like a, a retina scanner or a... Uh, a palm scanner, and that there's a big red button that the president would hit. And, and the truth of the matter is there's no button. That there's, well, what it is, is, it, you know, it's basically a telephone and a series of uh, binders with different war plans laid out, uh, sort of pre-selected, pre-designated war plans that would uh, sort of allow the president to glance down and pick from among a variety of options to sort of figure out what kind of nuclear war he wanted to launch very quickly. Uh, one military aide referred to it as a Denny's menu. You know, it's basically sort of pointed a picture, and that's the type of nuclear war that you order up. <laughs> and, and so the president would get on the phone, and you would have, you know, there are sort of all sorts of situational variations, but under a normal scenario, you know, he would call the Pentagon or he would call Raven Rock. He might directly call Strategic Command, uh, the Nuclear Military Command at, off at Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. And he would identify himself as the president. And, and in order to do that, he carries with him, the president carries with him basically a sealed index card uh, that is a code designed by the NSA, sealed inside uh, plastic, that he would break open, and it would be a code that he would read off over the phone to the person on the other end of the phone. And that's known as the nuclear biscuit. And it has a uh, sort of funny history as long as nothing has gone wrong with it which is, uh, as you said, sort of, it was lost in Ronald Reagan's clothes following his assassination attempt in 1981, uh, scooped up by the FBI as part of its evidence uh, gathering into the shooting. And he, then there was sort of a tussle between the White House and the FBI about getting it back. Bill Clinton actually lost his biscuit for some period of time, a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, and he is sort of, uh, they sort of only realized it or he only admitted it uh, when they came around to rotate the codes and he didn't have the old codes turn in anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and this is sort of still the system today. And, uh, and it's sort of part of what makes the system so interesting and so worrisome to people in the current political climate, uh, sort of why it's been so controversial over the last year, is that biscuit is all that a president needs to launch nuclear war. Uh, there is no sort of check on the system, the presidential level, to determine, uh, you know, is the president drunk? Is he high on drugs? Is he, <laughs> you know, mentally balanced? 
is there a legitimate reason for launching nuclear war? Um, that basically ju there's just that set of codes, and if it is successfully authenticated that he is the legal president of the United States at that moment, then the nuclear missiles are supposed to launch. And it's meant to be a very fast system. You know, from the moment that a president gives a launch order, the first missiles are supposed to leave their silos four minutes later. I mean, wow. there's not a lot of time for second guessing or further conversation after a presidential launch order. And, and as far as we know, going back through history, there has only been one time, and I tell this story in the introduction to the book, uh, where the president's launch authority uh, has been attempted to be circumscribed, which is he in the final days of Richard Nixon's presidency, uh, James Schlesinger, who was the defense secretary at the time, is uh, said later that he left word with the Pentagon that uh, if the Pentagon received any nuclear launch orders, they should uh, they should check with the uh, with Schlesinger or Secretary of State Henry Kissinger before executing the launch orders. And, and to be clear, there is no system for that check. That was an entirely extra legal procedure that Schlesinger tried to implement. And then actually, in the final hours of the Nixon presidency, without Nixon's knowledge, the military took away the nuclear briefcase. It, uh, it, as Richard Nixon sort of went on to Marine One, and then went on to Air Force One to fly home uh, while Gerald Ford was sworn in, that, that nuclear football didn't travel with him. He had no keys to the nuclear arsenal anymore uh, right. in those final hours, um, and, and, and no one knew it at the time. And, and that was because there was sort of such fear around his state of mind, that he had been uh, drinking heavily, he'd been despondent, he had actually even threatened a group of congressmen at one point by saying, you know, effectively, like, I can go start nuclear war anytime I want, and there's nothing you can do about it. So the, there was real fear that something weird might happen. Mm -hmm. And the system, you know, did its best to try to create an extra legal system to ensure that the president didn't purposely start an unnecessary nuclear war. So, uh, like I said, these stories are really sobering when you read through this book. And again, I recommend uh, picking it up. It's Raven Rock. Uh, pick up this book. Another story that I think is relatively new to us. We were all, most of us, um, are aware that it occurred and and that would live through it. Was the 9/11 crisis that occurred? And yep. I found it interesting. This was the first time recently that the that the cog was real was put to test with with this administration with with 9/11. And there were some serious flaws in there. And the one thing I found interesting was when Bush was put up in the air, and this is my words, he was sort of kidnapped by the Secret Service because they wouldn't let him go back to Washington, even though he requested it. And there was times when he was completely out of communication. Walk me through that and what you learned. Yeah, I mean, 9-11 is just fascinating day in so many ways. But this story, uh, as I tell in the book, of sort of how the continuity of government operations unfolded over the course of the day really stunned me. And, and some of that is, as you said, is realizing how out of touch president was for most of 9-11. That, you know, we think of 9-11 as such a modern moment, you know, it's sort of the beginning of the modern 21st century. But really, it was an entirely different world in terms of communication technology. You know, these, these were aides who were mostly relying upon pagers at that point. Air Force One had no satellite TV capability. And so as the president was flying aboard Air Force One that day, you know, he was as we remember, started the day, the elementary school in Sarasota, Florida, reading to that classroom. And then they were put aboard, he was put aboard Air Force One. It took off. 
and, and sort of spent the day flying over the Gulf of Mexico, then went to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, and then on to Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha before going back to Washington. And that for most of that time, uh, you know, Air Force One was only getting TV updates when they flew low over local TV stations. So, mm-hmm. you know, they'd sort of see the Jacksonville TV station over the Gulf of Mexico, and it would sort of come in and out, and then they would, you know, sort of fly off towards the Tallahassee TV stations, and then the Birmingham, or the, uh, you know, Jackson, Mississippi TV stations, and then on to the New Orleans one. And that the president was sort of actually less informed over the course of the day than the average American sitting at home watching CNN. And and that, as you said, sort of there was a second drama playing out aboard the plane that day that is uh, sort of so weird to understand, which is the extent to which the president uh, really, you know, was torn between these sort of two different responsibilities of the job. You know, the, to be the head of state, the person who sort of rallies the nation, the public face of reassurance, but then also the commander in chief, the head of the continuity of government, the head of the national command authorities who needed to be protected and held away uh, until the Secret Service and the military was confident that there weren't more attacks coming. And so he gets aboard the plane in Sarasota. He is immediately pushing to return to Washington. And then it's basically the the Air Force and the, the Secret Service who say, you know, Mr. President, we can't take you back there. You know, we've got to keep you safe until we know that these attacks are over. And he is immensely frustrated over the course of the day by being kept away from Washington. And, uh, but ultimately, he did listen to his aides, the pilot of Air Force One, Mark Tillman, his chief of staff, Andy Card at the moment, his uh, head of the, his Secret Service detail, and the military aide aboard the plane, you know, all convinced him that he couldn't actually return to Washington. And that that, uh, you know, I talked to Colonel Tillman about this, and he said, you know, thankfully, it never came right down to the president giving a direct order to return to Washington uh, because he doesn't really know how that would have unfolded. You know, he (laughs) obviously, as an Air Force colonel, you know, that's his commander in chief. But his job in that moment is to keep the commander in chief safe. And this very strange moment in the history of the continuity of government programs, but one that really has been sort of predicted since the earliest days that presidents have sort of long understood in this world that you can either stay secure or you can stay in command. And that often those are actually directly opposed. And Mm -hmm. so when you look at people like actually Jimmy Carter, who as they sort of thought through how they would respond in an emergency, Jimmy Carter's official plan was that he would die in the White House, that he would remain at the White House, he would not be evacuated, and that he would leave it to the vice president to be evacuated, and that he would stay there in command right up until the last minute to ensure that the U.S. government had leadership uh, until that final minute. And that seemed to be the the general consensus of all the presidents, right, that if something's going down, they were going to stay in the White House, all the way to Truman, right? And in fact, there's sort of the, these interesting moments. I mean, we, we sort of as a country lived through this nuclear false alarm with Hawaii, you know, a couple Saturdays ago. Right. But, we, uh, but those nuclear false alarms actually happen with some routineness over the last 70 years. Uh, on the internal side, you know, within government, they play out. And that, as you said, sort of going right back to Harry Truman, that when there was a false alarm that there were Soviet bombers on their way to Washington, Truman just stayed at his desk working uh, with the expectation that it would be, uh, you know, sort of other staff uh, and other personnel who were who would be evacuated 
to sort of keep the country going afterwards, but that he saw his primary role as that figurehead uh, remaining in control. Does continuity of government work? It's better than nothing, which which is uh, a little bit of some damning with faint praise. Uh, you know, these are plans that we absolutely need. It's great that the government practices them, drills them, has exercises, tabletop in real world to, to practice them. But I think one of the constants when you look back through this history is that there is a, almost no chance that most of these plans would have worked. And, and that in many cases, you know, they would have uh, sort of failed uh, or, or been hung up by very obvious challenges. One of the, the most obvious ones, it, uh, dating back literally to the first evacuation drill under Dwight Eisenhower, is the plans don't include people's families. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, no spouses, no children. And so everyone in that moment would be forced to make this very uh, deep and human choice about do you leave your family behind or do you... Uh, you know, follow your responsibilities to the government. That shows up when you talk about the Supreme Court, where the Chief Justice said, I'm not leaving my wife, so be it. I'm not going. Exactly. Earl Warren sort of turned down when he was Chief Justice the opportunity to participate in these plans because he was like, if Mrs. Warren isn't coming, then I'm not go going either. And so we don't, you know, that's one of those big questions that we just don't know how that would unfold in the moment is whether and sort of how much, how many people would choose to remain with their families rather than being evacuated as scheduled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's so much more in this book that we can get into. I mean, you talk about the uh, private company czars that, that, uh, that we created, you know, uh, the idea of that we're going to be you're basically coming into to a very fascist slash communist type of, of uh, government uh, overseeing every aspect of life um, after a nuclear war to someday maybe get back to constitutional government. And I thought that was really interesting considering the fact that we were in war with, or, you know, the Cold War with a government that was doing thing that we wanted them that we we're going to do to protect us from that. You know, I, I found that really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, as you said, there's just, it there's an incredible amount to sort of unwind in these programs and to sort of think through. And that was part of what uh, just got me so interested in the subject, the deeper and deeper I got into it was realizing the, the existential questions that these emergency management uh, and emergency preparedness plans brought to the fore over the course of the Cold War. And so we're coming here close to the end uh, of your time. You know, uh, this is a really good read. It's called Raven Rock by Garrett Graff. You can get this at any of your uh, normal booksellers. I highly recommend getting it. I got the Audible uh, download because I, I drive a, a pretty significant uh, uh, ride into work. And I also bought the hard hardback uh, book. So I, I really do well, recommend it. <laughs> and, um, you know, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us before we let you go? No, thanks so much for having me on. Hey, no problem. And, uh, you know, if you if you have anything else that's coming up, uh, please feel free to, to reach out. We'd love to have you on again. My, my pleasure. <laughs>